Hello, everybody. Welcome to A French Village Podcast. I'm here with my brilliant friend, Ben Wittes, and we are talking about episodes five and six, which were action-packed, drama-filled, Ben. The commies are back. The commies are back in force. I'm, I'm excited about the commies being back because uh, they, you know, bring action, action to the show. Yeah, uh, they are. And and because I would say we, we managed to we had two rich hour or we had a, a rich hour last week and they were, you know, discussed the two episodes. But I was sort of like aware that we were spending a lot of time in the woods yeah. and uh, there was a lot more this go round of. Uh, you know, cockroach trials, cockroach trials, which is a, um, charming, um, there, you know, we, we are, there's a little bit of a band. Well, it's not the band getting back together because they don't all know each other, but we all know them. Right. So like we know Anselm, we know Raul, we know Marcel and they're all in the cell together. Um, and of course they share arguing over a cockroach, arguing over a cockroach, but they share lots of things in common. Uh, not the least of which is that they are all part of the resistance. Um, but they don't, but they don't really know each other. Um, but also lots, lots going on with all of our other characters. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got bad people doing bad people things, uh, between Shasanya and, um, uh, uh, and Hortense and, and Muller, um, and, and I guess Janine's kind of a bit part for this, but, uh, and we've got, uh, uh, Lucienne singing. Who knew she could sing? It's not a surprise because she plays violin well, but, uh, she kind of cuts loose and sings. Um, we had a lot going on this episode. We got uh, the play is coming together in the woods. <laughs> we got the a kidnapping of the doctor. Yeah. So, uh, so going back to where we we had started last week, we ended last week's podcast with a bit of an uh, argument, not an argument, but we were we uh, we were discussing whether or not there was a, he'd uh, Antoine had shot the one of the German soldiers. Right. But he had, he had not shot the German soldier. They just well, he shot one of them and then just taken the other one prisoner. So they've got one healthy prisoner and one wounded German. And uh, we see Antoine uh, go to the doctor's house, go to Daniel Larcher's house. Uh, and when Daniel refuses, <laughs> this is actually a little bit of a funny scene where he's like, well, you know, he's shot. And he's like, well, you shouldn't have shot him <laughs> like you're you're bad, bro. Uh, but of course, yeah, and I mean, he's not going to come with them. And so I, I got to say, these couple these couple episodes flatter neither uh, Larche nor Antoine. Uh, so Antoine is so concerned about uh, the about the sort of moral preening he's engaged in about the uh, health of this German soldier whom he shot, uh, that he engages in a kidnapping of a doctor of, of Larche in order to get him treated. Um, that does not strike me as um, a sort of attractive behavior. Um, and then Larche, uh, inexplicably unties the other, having been kidnapped, uh, basically allies himself with the German soldiers and, uh, and unties one of them and allows one of the French resistance kids to get shot. And I, I, I have to say, you know, Larche kind of ebbs and flows in his, in his attractiveness Judgment. as that character. <laughs> Uh, but this is like one of the one of his low moments, and of course he doesn't know this uh, poor guy. But uh, but both Gustav and uh, Tequero are left alone uh, on their own because uh, the two Jews that they're har harboring, uh, Ezekiel and Sarah, both get arrested, and so uh, you know he's. The, the the alignments here are are really really peculiar and 
uh, I have to say it's not a situation that makes anybody look good except Marie. Marie is excellent in this episode, uh, including the part where uh, so and and we'll, we'll talk about this, but but Antoine's sister um, and Schwartz's wife, uh, who has gone to the farmer Anselm in the last episode uh, and then gone to visit Antoine. Um, that was not a great move. Everybody said it wasn't a great move, uh, told her not to go see him. Uh, and it that security breach did lead the cops to Anselm, uh, actually Schwartz, uh, it led him to, to Antoine's sister. Uh, and then Schwartz, uh, who tries to plead with her to just tell him that, that look, his goose is cooked. There's nothing we can do for him. The only question is whether you go down uh, with him. Uh, and when she won't, he basically gives up on Psalm thinking that it might save her. But instead, what it does is land her in Marchetti's uh, Muller Jr. room where he burns on Psalm with cigarettes to try to get her to talk. And rather than talk, she jumps out of a window. Um, and and in yeah, doing, it's an ugly mm, scene. You got uh, the, it's a brutal scene. You, you got the cigarette burning torture. You got the suicide. It's 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 ugly. Uh, it's a it's a brutal scene, and also um, uh, it is Marchetti going overboard in a way that costs him. Uh, but it is it is Marie who has to go deliver the news to Antoine, and she does have this sort of great scene where he is uh, he immediately grabs his luger and sort of points it at the you know he wants to take out his anger and rage on somebody, and so he wants to do it in his German captive and she kind of smacks him across the face uh, and then hugs him. And, and there is in that moment, and this is the thing about the kids in the, the guys in the woods in general, which is that they're, they're, they're not quite men yet. And, and part of Antoine's capturing or, or holding hostage Daniel to come do this, you know, there's a, an immaturity to, to his actions and a kind of, um, you know, he's, He's romanticized his own role. Uh, these these guys are listening to him. But of course, he he takes it sort of too far because he doesn't quite have the maturity level to handle it. And there's a way that Marie handles him that reminds you that they're boys. And uh, I was I was actually talking to uh, I'm at my in-laws and we were talking about the scenes in the forest and sort of the Shakespearean nature of being in the forest. And at some point they started citing uh, all the literature around how the forest is meant to be a metaphor for many things. It is transformative in a lot of literature that you get to go there and, and sort of change yourself. Um, and I do think that what we're seeing, and without getting too ahead, like it is transformative for these young men. They're having these experiences where they make the wrong decisions. They do act rashly. Uh, and then hopefully they come out the other side, actual resistance members, as opposed to just kids in the woods with sticks. Or dead. Yeah, um, or dead. Which, you know, some of them are are clearly headed toward. Um, so I want to focus on Larche for a moment. Because, you know, this is somebody who we've seen undergo a lot of personal growth. Um and he goes from, you know, a quite complicit government official to somebody who's steps aside rather than participate, ends up harboring not just Sarah, with whom he's having an affair, but Ezekiel, with whom he's not. Um, and yet, faced with these young kids and or the German soldiers, uh, is more outraged by the behavior of the kids um, than he is, you know, understanding of their situation. He berates one of them for avoiding forced labor. Um, he helps one of the German soldiers get untied and gets one of them shot. What's up with this guy? And like, like I'd really spent the last few seasons 
you know, being very sympathetic with him. And now you have him within the space of one episode going from, you know, not wanting to treat a German soldier at all, which I can quite understand, to helping one escape at the expense of the French resistance kids. I'm just, I'm having trouble understanding how to piece together the character here. Yeah, so, I mean, I'll just, like, I'll share to take a crack at that. So, first of all, you know, I know what Stockholm Syndrome is, right, when you identify with your captors. I don't think there's a, a word for something, but when you, you start to identify with the other people being held captive, like, what's interesting about that scene is that an alliance is formed because they are both being held prisoner by the same people, and that Larche has been brought there at gunpoint and feels not a tremendous amount of fidelity with these young men in the woods who have captured him. So he is their hostage. So I think on one level, that's part of it. But then there's the then there's Larche in general. And I think what's interesting about his sort of humanist behavior is he makes moral judgments in the moment as opposed to having what I would consider like a higher moral position or aim the way Marcel does, right? Like Marcel has a code. And so he makes uh, minor poor moral decisions, often like abandoning his son, uh, in service to his higher aim. Larche is the inverse, where he doesn't have the higher aim, but he tries to, but he makes like decent decisions in each moment. And in that moment, he is, he thinks that the German soldier who is now like, They've talked, you know, he talks about his dad, the German soldier says his dad was a communist. Like he, he's clearly talked to him enough to know that that kid, he can see that that kid is just a kid uh, and that he's got a wounded friend and that he didn't deserve to be taken hostage either. And uh, now tactically, you're right. It's like gobsmacking and he should know whose side he's on generally. And that like, there's no good comes of letting the German guy just like run away with a gun. Um that being said, I don't think it's I don't think it's entirely out of character for him to make like a minor moral judgment that seems correct to him. Because you do, I mean, part of the episode is the fact that the Antoine is is going too far. I guess. I mean, I was trying to think about it in terms of your larger thesis about the show as a kind of meditation on complicity in the Trump era and to think about who are the Larches uh, of this time period. And I thought I knew the answer to that question, right? There's, you know, the good people who make little compromises and little compromises become big compromises. And, you know, before you know it, you're uh, Paul Ryan. Um, but I I guess I don't, I can't identify a character in the, um, in the modern era who's harboring two Jews in his house at great risk to himself and his family, and only one of them because he's sleeping with her, um, but who's also freeing German soldiers and resisting, uh, but doesn't, you know, doesn't want to treat them at all, but then once put with them, acts to free them. I, this starts to look like a very idiosyncratic set of behaviors to me that doesn't track on to some of the larger themes that we're, we've been talking about at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how to explain it other than to kind of restate my thesis on him which is that he's a humanist. And so he sees each human being. And like, if you give him the choice, he doesn't want to treat Germans. But if you put a hurt German in front of him, he helps him because that's what Larche does. Like he doesn't, he doesn't take those bigger, broader stance. He looks at every person and he tries to do what he can for them. Um, it's, it's the same way, you know, the, the, the conversation he has with Cohn is, is a little bit of the same model of morality, right? He is, he has, he has now taken him in for much longer than he, than Cohn had originally asked. He's been there since he says a month, uh, when they'd originally agreed on a week. And be, that's because Daniel doesn't really have it in him to just 
shunt this guy out. At the same time, as he says, when he tell he's telling Cohen, like, we just can't go on like this. He knows he's endangering his own family um, to do this. And he is, he is going to make him leave. Um, and so, you know, I don't know, like that, I don't, I guess I, I don't, I don't find Daniel's, I find Daniel to be mostly comprehensible because I can understand how when you are confronted with the person as opposed to an abstract idea of Germans, Daniel always treats or helps the person the same way the abstract, he didn't do anything about the abstract Jews, but if you show him a Jew in distress, he will take them in. That's interesting. All right, let's talk about his brother, because his brother also has, you know, a bad moral episode, couple moral episodes, uh, although ending up in a uh, condemned cell, uh, uh, defending a cockroach at trial, uh, will mediates it a bit, but they... um, uh, his treatment of Suzanne in the first episode is really awful. And uh, I was quite sympathetic with her just breaking up with him over it. Um, uh, although, of course, she then feels terribly guilty because he gets arrested by the Germans or by the French gendarme. But he... Um, uh, I mean, basically looks her in the eye and says, uh, it's like that scene in Annie Hall where the little kid says, you know, nothing matters because the universe is expanding. And he's like, you know, our life together doesn't matter. Uh, if we die, it doesn't matter because, you know, world revolution and all that. And he just, you know, reveals himself to be in the service of, as you say, exactly the opposite of his brother, who has no grand ideals, but deals with the situation in front of him, totally unable to deal with the situation in front of him, totally unable to accept that her feelings about anything matter uh, or that their children matter um, because he's you know, building a, a, a new world and a new society. And of course, we know that the new society he's dreaming of is Stalinism, uh, which I guess he doesn't really fully understand. And But it's still like he comes out of it looking really awful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you had to, so part of the the Larche brothers, I mean, we're not through the show yet, but I think obviously their their arcs are not entirely finished. Um, so we don't know quite where they end up. But the Larche brothers, they're opposite ends of poles. I mean, you know, just Marcel is just pure ideology. And like to the point where it makes him sort of a monster to be with, whereas Daniel's quite nice to be with and you understand him often. But like at the same time, he's 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 confronting a moment of where you have to take moral stands and he's incapable of taking them, uh, where it's what his brother has is only them. Um, but like, but I will just say, so you are a Suzanne Stan. You are somebody who, who sort of completely loves Suzanne. I get it. I like her too. Uh, however, there is a part of me that like admires the fact that he has a fidelity to something larger than himself and where she does strike me as a little bit, it's not like, like, of course people should still try to find love in these moments. And, uh, but, I, and, and it's not like crazy for her, you know, her to ask this guy that she's, I mean, they're like boyfriend, girlfriend or whatever, you know, to imagine a life after the war, even if just to have comfort in conversation, but there is something about her that comes off as a little bit, um, maybe overly needy. I don't know. Like I, I don't, I don't have as, I don't have as tough a reaction to him in, in this moment. Uh, because I sort of find her to be, she's, she's overdoing it in my mind a little bit. And I'll also say like it, because he's so committed to his ideology, you can, you like, you at least under, I've never liked it, but you can understand how he's decided that this trumps his son and everything else. It's, it's weird to me 
that if she doesn't quite feel that way, that it that that she has allowed this to keep away from her daughter, which is clearly difficult for her. And if if what is keeping her sort of there is less a commitment to a cause and more because she's in love with Marcel, that strikes me as like slightly selfish. I don't know. I think you're being easy on him and rough on her. <laughs> she, she has given up as much for the cause as he has. Uh, she, They've both basically not seen their child for two years. Uh, she's been sentenced to death by her own party. Um, and uh, she's they're both in hiding. Um, they are both engaged in... They're both, you know, uh, subject to basically being arrested and killed on sight, which which in this case happens to him, although, excuse me, not the killed part. Um, and uh, the only thing she's asking for is for him to acknowledge the costs and you know, not pretend that it's all nothing that they've given up and to not to, and to not refuse to uh, acknowledge that, you know, there are regrets associated with that and there are feelings associated with that and that she uh, dreams of a normal life after the war with him. I, I guess I I find his... I don't find that needy. I mean, that's the kind of thing you do to keep yourself going. Yeah, that's probably right. I mean, he doesn't, see, I mean, I wouldn't date Marcel. Like, he doesn't <laughs> seem like a, he doesn't seem like a fun ride, that guy. Uh, no, he's pretty, he's, he's, he's kind of a sour guy. He's a real sour guy. And like, will never, uh, I don't know. I just, I guess I just, I, it seems like other than I guess he's handsome on some level, that what she's, attracted to about him seems like his commitment to the cause. Uh, and then what annoys her about him is the relentless commitment to the cause. But look, I don't know. You're making a fair point. Uh, I don't want to be too hard on Suzanne. She is, she's in my upper echelon of characters, uh, but she does get him knit. Yes. She, uh, uh, and you know, she ditches him at the, at the restaurant where they're, um, on mission to, to warn a waiter that they're going to get arrested uh, or that he's risking arrest. The cops show up and she's vanished and left him a note. And the note incriminates him because it says his name and he's, he's going to get away with it. But then the cop looks at the note and realizes he's Marcel Larche, wanted terrorist, and so into the clink he goes, uh, where there's nothing else to do but get tortured, wait for your execution, and in the meantime, defend a cockroach at trial. Yeah, I do. I mean, this little touches of the show where you've got sort of three characters that you know in one spot and that they <laughs> they decide, uh, like, it, it is... Um, it is both sort of adorable, but also meaningful, right? I mean, Marcel gets to argue as the people that uh, the conditions of the cockroach can't change his conditions. It is his nature to be a cockroach. Uh, and it's a it's it's a it's a touching scene. Yes. And of course, each of them is playing the role. Anselm is the the gallist who's just like, you know, let me smash the cockroach. He's disgusting. <laughs> and, you know, he represents uh, uh, conventional power and attitudes. And um, uh, he's, um, uh, and then Marcel is, you know, talking about the cockroach as the oppressed of the earth. Um, <laughs> and the poor kid, um, uh, uh, Raul is like has to be the judge, but gets saved by the bell, um, uh, because the actual Nazis come in to execute the deten the the defense lawyer 
who we knew was going to be executed because he's the one character in the room we we're not don't attached know. to. Yeah, yeah, we're not <laughs> attached to. So you're like, this guy is totally getting killed by the end of the show. He's also like, uh, it's really unfair to him because as best we can tell, he committed the most minor infraction. I mean, these other guys are legit part of the resistance. So while obviously we're on their side, like by the by the code of the times, they did something to land themselves there. This other guy sounds like he just was trying to get his wife some meat because she was had an iron deficiency. Yep. Or at least that's what he says. That's you what have he no says. Idea. Who knows? You have no idea what the rap sheet on him looks like. But in any event, when the Nazis come to shoot somebody, uh, I'm always on their side, irrespective of who they are. So, uh, <laughs> And also, he's got the glasses. Uh, so he's like, they're setting him up as, you know, the sort of nerdy fall guy. Um, all right. Well, let's, so we also have, uh, we have our Muller is, is getting deeper and deeper into the pain, uh, which causes Hortense to go looking for, uh, more morphine, which leads her back to Chassanye, Chassan, Chassanya, and it's gross, predictably gross. Yeah, I mean, you knew you knew this was coming. Um, uh, it turns out Shasanya is not giving Mueller morphine for nothing. Uh, he's, you know, uh, uh, he wants a bit of Hortense for it. She walks out on him the first time, but then Mueller almost dies um, from sleeping pills he takes to avoid the morphine withdrawal. Uh, I can't tell at this point whether this is more about pain management or more just about morphine addiction. I think it's more the latter than the former at this point. But, um, uh, and so she uh, goes back to Shasani with um, uh, a, you know, resigned to uh, sexual extortion as the price of morphine uh, and of course, lies to uh, to uh, uh, Mueller about it. He thinks she's getting it from her husband, um, and he learns only at the end when he turns into a postcard that she's not getting it from Larche because he's been kidnapped. Uh, and so that's the end of the the episode. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, I have to say, in the, in the uh, battle between evil people, uh, I have a kind of uh, Iran-Iraq war attitude toward maybe Hitler-Stalin pact attitude toward uh, this. Like, uh, in, like I, I hope they damage each other maximally, or the, the, if there's three of them, but, you know, uh, I... I, I hope they hurt each other maximally. I'm not sure whose side I'm on. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a, you can look at it, look, I'm a glass half full kind of person. So I see this as kind of a win-win. Like, however terrible they are to each other, they all deserve it. And so, oh, is Mueller, does Mueller, is Mueller in pain? Good. Yeah, that good. is a good part. Do you have yeah. chronic pain? Does it hurt? Uh, a lot. Yeah. Uh, not enough, my friend. Not enough. Uh, I was also, there's this scene where they, he hugs, um, he hugs Hortense and I'm always reminded that he is a small man. He's a, he's a petite man, a little guy. Yes. Although I, I think, uh, she is also a very tall woman. She might be, she might be. <laughs> uh, so, all right. Um, so let's talk about, and uh, there's another trio, a nicer trio, more pleasant trio, in Berio, Lucien, and Marguerite. Uh, what do you make of their, their, their jaunty times together? So there is still something big we do not know about Marguerite. Um, she is actively cultivating both Lucien and Berio. She is really interested in the idea of integrating herself into the resistance, either because she's a 
been involved in the resistance and wants to be again, or because she's acting on somebody's instructions um, or at somebody's behest, she does in fact get a mission uh, later on. She she runs uh, an important message to Marie, um, and uh, and the show spends a considerable amount of time in this episode. Uh, showing her to be uh, genuinely, you know, almost flirting with both Berio and uh, Lucien, and Berio gets very drunk, and the two of them drag him to bed, and uh, he's... Uh, you know, they're both quite entranced with her. They actually argue about it at one point, but neither of them kind of stays, you know, neither of them talks the other out of staying away from her. And it's totally not clear what her game is, at least not to me. So you do, okay, so you sort of picked up on the, I think that there is a, when they're arguing, Barrio and Lucien, and Lucien is the one making the case, like, well, why are we having dinner with her again? Uh, but... Uh, underneath her complaint seems to be jealousy that Marguerite and Barrio have set up this dinner and the jealousy doesn't seem to be related to Barrio. <laughs> like, I don't think she's uh, right. Like, it doesn't seem like that's the way that it. it's not. She's not she's not doesn't feel like someone's encroaching on her husband. It's the other way. Yeah. And she's I mean, she's confided this deep, dark secret in Marguerite that she's thinking of Kurt all the time. Um, she is, uh, you know, she's tolerant of, of Berio and fond of him, but it's hardly her passion in life. Uh, she is not animated by uh, his passions in life, which are you know, republicanism and kind of doing the right thing with Marie. Uh, she's a very small person in a charming, lovely sort of way. She really does not see the forest for the trees around her ever. And um, she clearly wants uh, wants Marguerite for herself, Um uh, and doesn't want her to have a kind of independent resistance relationship with Barrio, or doesn't want, as you say, Barrio to have an independent relationship with her. Yeah. Uh, and I think you're right that it is incredibly unclear. There's a seduction going on, but it's in unclear to what end and and to whom it is exactly directed. Yes, it's, I mean, it's clear that Marguerite wants in on resistance activity. It's not clear at all what she wants with Lucien, other than to ingratiate herself with her uh, uh, for purposes of getting to Berrio. But her interest in Berrio does not appear to be romantic or sexual. It appears to be political. Right. And there does seem to be a whole lot of uh, 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 energy, shall we say, in the room between the two of them, uh, between Lucienne and Marguerite. And so I think it's totally unclear what's going on, uh, at least from the vantage point of somebody who has not seen the episodes to come. Okay, well, here's the part where I feel the need to say that I can spot a burgeoning lesbian subplot coming from miles away but there is just a there's a way that people work tensions in 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 every time they want there to be that that uh a lesbian subplot that like i just my antennas go go right up i was alluding to this in the last um episode but i think it's, you can clearly see the energy to me what is interesting about the way that lucienne is reacting is that it is clear uh that they that that she there is something intoxicating to her about Marguerite. Um, do you you see that? Or so I totally buy that. That's you know, I, I I completely agree with that. 
I, it's just unclear to me at this stage whether that's in service of some devious plot Marguerite has going or whether that is the thing that Marguerite has going. Um, you know, like, is her role here that she's an important resistance figure, that she's right. a love interest for Lucien, or that she's a spy for, you know, Heinrich Müller? Do you, uh, do you, do you want to make a bet? What do you think? Sent in order to be Lucien's love interest <laughs> and thereby break up the Berio plot, you know? Um, I. I mean, I I have to say, based on your reaction, it seems to me we've we've um, uh, and that you know what happens uh, that tends to favor the uh, love interest as its own uh, thing explanation. But um, but I'm gonna I'm I'm still I I still think. They wouldn't spend all this time gathering mystery about, around Marguerite if there weren't some really important plot component associated with the revelation of uh, what is mysterious about her. Yeah, well, I'm not saying there's a sub. I'm just saying that, like, at this juncture in the show, I remember this is the first time that I was on, like, this is what I see coming. Like, I know how, oh. how I know how the groundwork gets laid for this stuff. Uh, I I look. I mean. And also, you know, uh, and Lucien kind of gives the game away on that because she and she does it to Barrio. You know, he's trying to figure out how he ended up in bed. And uh, she uh, explains that it's, you know, system uh, Marguerite and uh, and Lucien, which is LM, um, LM yeah. which is, you know, his way of flirting with her is to describe system B. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, and so she's, you know, basically taunting him that, you know, the two of us dragged you up to bed. Um, no, it's, it's, it's clear that they're, you know, creating sexual tension between the two of them. The, the only question is whether Berrio is involved, although he was unconscious in the first instance. So. I just have to say that this scene is like super dumb in that regard. Like the the, the Berrio is, first of all, like when did he get that drunk? OK, right. like and do you know how drunk you have to be to literally have people dropping your head on the floor, and like dragging you and not like be snoring like this was like a that that, that you know. For sure. Well, I, I, I don't need to be drunk at all to snore, but that's just me. <laughs> but like, um, I mean, someone drags you like up the stairs or like dread Yeah, you're going to remember it the next morning. So yeah, silly. no, that part didn't work. And mm. actually, I think the the um, the broader scene where, you know, Marguerite gets Lucien to sing and she's a kind of, you know, she has this moment of... Uh, 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 liberated experience singing that is, you know, is kind of cheap, but okay. Um, uh, so, you know, we're going to see. Um, hey, but we have buried the big event, which is that Suzanne is going to bust Marcel out of prison uh, and she's recruited... Uh, um, uh, Marie by dangling in front of her face that Raoul is in the same prison cell. Uh, the commies have abandoned her. They won't help her. So she's gone rogue and gone over to the Gaullists for help. Uh, and we've got an incipient jailbreak coming. You, you think that's what you're going to lay money that these, I mean, the communists are basically like, Look, Suzanne, we were wrong about you. You're fine, but like, we're not breaking anyone out of prison. Like, let's not be stupid. Uh, but you think that she and Marie, you think that they're going to do like the Great Escape women resistance version? You're putting your money on that. I think I am. Yeah, or at least they're going to try. I mean, I don't know if they're yeah. going to succeed. And but look, I, I, you always bet on the survival of major characters, and Marcel has been in the show since the first episode of the first season. He's 
you know, disappears for uh, an episode or two here and there, but he's always there. The brothers Larche are an important fixture of the show. And uh, he is under a death sentence. And the only thing standing between him and uh, getting shot like the uh, like like the the defense lawyer in the cockroach case, the only thing other than Heinrich Muller, uh, you know, wanting to keep him alive for for more torture and names is, you know, uh, a jailbreak. And so I'm kind of betting that it's got to happen. Yeah. OK, great. Well, I we should we shall see. We shall. We have great things in our future. Then we have a potential lesbian subplot. We have a potential jailbreak. This is all sounding very exciting, like a great show, like something we should watch and make a podcast about. I, almost uh, like we should watch it and make a <laughs> podcast about it. Uh, here's so my here's here's my question for you, right? So, from a a broader political landscape, the show is starting to. We've been talking about this now, where. You know, why why is Hortense so frantic at the moment? Like, why is she sleeping with Chassagne uh, for morphine for Muller? And By the way, all- can, I, can I just say, I'm not sure I have ever seen a show in which a character has sunk lower than prostituting herself to... Uh, fascist collaborationist in order to score morphine for the SS guy. Like, yeah. like that's about as low as it goes. I honestly, so obviously like this scene is revolting and it's better when her reaction is to knee him in the groin. Um, because, you know, in, despite what I said before about like, we all win whenever terrible things happen to these people. Obviously I don't root for the creepy guy sexually right. exploiting and doing what is um, tantamount to rape in for for morphine, um, but but my point was only that like her her desperation at this point is coming from the fact that Mueller's deterioration is kind of tracking with the deterioration of the German the whole German uh, enterprise and uh, and so you know she is getting frantic I think as she's seeing. Not just him, you know, there's this part in the show where he, she thinks he's dead because he's taken a bunch of sleeping pills so he can sleep and his tolerance now is so high. And so she just thinks he's dead, but he's not. Uh, and she's, that, that that's what makes her go back to Chassigny and be willing to, to, to sink so low. Um, and so this, this, this desperation means that like, you could basically plot in Mueller's deterioration, and her desper- desperation, like where the war is at the moment. And then, you know, obviously the resistance and and I'll say, going back to the conversation about Larche, is it possible that the Germans at this point, I I don't know, are they becoming more brutal or are they becoming more, is everyone starting to hit that point where everyone's like, if if we keep our heads down, maybe we survive this thing, you know, like this, the outcome is starting to become apparent. Um, I, I don't know that for sure, but I guess the question is, is like, where are we in history right now? Yeah, so it's a really, I mean, I think the fall of 43 is a really interesting time, right? Because the Allies haven't landed yet. Nobody knows when it's going to happen, but people know it's going to happen, right? You know, the forward momentum of the German army, which, you know, if you if you think of it from... 1939 on, it's like this supernova, right? It Like they conquer the entire European continent except sp- this Spanish peninsula and certain territories that their allies like the Italians hold. But they basically conquer all of Europe. And then that's 42, it starts to recede. And by you know, or it apexes kind of at 42, in, in late 42. And then in, in this period, you've had Stalingrad, you've had Kursk, right? The Eastern Front, they are mounting just me- unbelievable casualties. Um, so the, the surrender at Stalingrad is literally 100,000 people are, you know, uh, uh, are uh, 
surrender. And I think 5,000, 6,000 of them ever got back to Germany. I mean, it was really like, and that was the remainder of the sixth army that was essentially destroyed. And so over the next, you know, year and a half, two years, everything they took is retaken. Um, and so this is a period where the tide of, you know, the tides are really turning and people feel that. And I was trying to think about, you know, in the larger sort of metaphor of the show that you, uh, you know, start the premise of the podcast is, you know, how does this relate to, you know, kind of modern complicity? Um what was the fall of 43 in our experience? The period in which, you know, okay, Normandy hasn't happened yet. You know, it's not over. There's still a lot of fighting to do, but the kids are camped out in the woods and the local SS, you know, SD guy is, you know, high on morphine and kind of everybody knows that Normandy's coming. Um, and I was thinking, like, it's, you know, and the Hortense figures are increasingly desperate. I don't know who the Hortense figure is, you know, maybe Kaylee McEnany or somebody. But, um, you know, they're sort of increasingly desperate. Um, and and yet the Chassagnes are are you know, emphatic that all we need is will and more collaboration, right? The 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 Stephen Millers and the uh, Jason Millers, right, are, you know, convinced that we just, you know, just, you know, send, send the Germans a, a few hundred people to as hostages. Um, it feels like that, like that period in which the, is kind of like, I don't know, sort of the the like the end of of the second half of 2020 when we're or the sorry the first half of 2020 when you're kind of heading into you know B Biden kind of is clearly going to get the nomination. You have this incipient pandemic, but it hasn't really hit yet. Um, and the rot of the Trump folks is is complete, but there are still these bitter enders, which I suppose there still are. Um, I like when does it? I don't know when does it feel like to you in in the uh, not that we went through the occupation of France, of course, but that you know that's that's the larger metaphor of the show. Yeah, like my real answer is I feel like. It's tough to draw a parallel because I'm not sure we've we've hit the point yet that that where we've turned the corner. I do think that there's something to be said for um, there was a time, and I would call it like March 2020, where we knew that Biden was going to win the uh, and and that was that was very key for me. Like the period of time where I thought Bernie Sanders was going to be the nominee, and I was deeply certain Bernie Sanders was going to lose to Donald Trump. Uh, and not only that, it was going to create, like, I was just going to create every, for the people that I needed to convince for the work that I was doing, it was going to be impossible. Like, you were not going to convince moderate Republicans to vote for Bernie Sanders. And so, like, it just, I, so there's this period of time where I thought, like, everything is so bad. Like, it's going to be Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. And then it, like, Biden gets the nominee. Like, Biden, you know, whipsaws out of South Carolina and into Super Tuesday, and I began to feel so much better. And, like, I was like, okay, we're we're in this. Like, you've got somebody who can who can build a broad base of support. And then, I mean, you got to, the polling, which turned out to be catastrophically wrong a second time, but there was a period going into November, a kind of a long period through that summer, where Biden was just, like, holding steady at like an 11 point lead. Like he just, he like had, it had not changed at all. And it was showing 11 points in, and there was, you could smell the fear on the Trumpers that like they were going to lose to Biden. Uh, and like the, the people 
the anti-antis who had been kind of uh, defending him, protecting him, you know, certainly hating us, <laughs> spending their time focused on the how bad. Serviers. The ser- Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the, they were starting to write their editorials and it was like, they, they, they didn't denounce Trump, but it was like the Peggy Noonan said, well, I'm going to write in Edmund Burke and NRO, <laughs> NRO, which had done in 2016, they're against Trump issue. Uh, this time did their maybe Trump editorial. Uh, deeply brave, deeply brave. Yeah, it was, uh, that was a, a high moment for the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I but I do think we felt like we were on offense is what I would say. And, and what's crazy is there was like, the, go ahead. Yeah. No. So, I mean, I think that's the key point that, you know, and some people here, some people haven't realized it yet. So, like, I think one of the things about Larche is he hasn't realized that these kids are actually on offense, that Marie is on offense, that she's waiting for orders from from London and she actually has a better sense than the Germans do of when the when the invasion's going to be. Um you know, she's like, it's not going to happen this year. The Germans don't know that. Um, and so, like, they're they're playing offense for the first time, and um, and there's a perception of that. And I think there's a, I think that was early 2000, late 2019 for us. Yeah. Um, I just, I'll say, though, that, one of the things that's crazy and the reason I can't quite, uh, I can't get there on the analogy uh, though. I think the things that the offense part part is real. The dynamic shift was real is that when Trump lost, right, there were these, it was so much closer. It was so much closer than we had thought it was going to be because the polling was so off. And, and, and because we were in the middle of a pandemic, it took so long for the results to come in that, uh, I would say, you know, the election felt not quite as cathartic as uh, as the Allies storming. Uh, yeah, well, or- we thought we thought the election was going to be uh, was going to be, you know, the fall of Berlin. The election turned out to be Normandy, and there was still like, you know, a long s- s- bit of fighting. People forget this, but. The worst casualties of the war uh, are in 1945. You know, like that's the period where just huge numbers of people, because they were fighting street to street. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so like I think of that as like that's, you know, the period from the election to through January 6th to the inauguration. Yeah, but like the thing about January 6th, and it's crazy, you know, because obviously we're watching the the hearings or the hearings yesterday uh, or maybe it's the day before. But in any event, when January 6th happened, I thought that was for sure the end. Like we, and you know, you talk about offense. That was the moment. I mean, it was like this was like the we told you so moment, right? You've been the resistance the whole time. And you're saying to all the accommodators. All the people who've been making excuses, it's not that bad. This is, you know, this is okay. You guys are overreacting. We were, that was the moment we were like, this is what we've been saying the whole time. And a whole bunch of people who had done the anti anti Trump dance said, yeah, he's got to be impeached, like whatever. And then they all walked it back. Right. And, and, and like today they are back to being Trump apologists or pretending like Trump doesn't exist and saying, why is Liz Cheney not on the team? And I would just say that because of all that, to me, it feels like we are actually in not any way analogous to that historical context, but more pre potentially the, the early forties where we're still in those moments where like, we don't know how bad things could get because the country is being pulled apart uh, by... Yeah, I, I, I don't want to overstate the analogy. I don't want to say, like, the... Um, like, because fundamentally that was a cataclysmic war that had an end, and this is an ongoing ideological struggle and, uh, and an ongoing political struggle, and it's not clear 
that it has an end or that when we understand it to have an end, the end will be when Trump left office rather than, you know, when Ron DeSantis is routed uh, or some other, you know. I, I think the value of the analogy is only on the side of evaluating complicity and the sense of momentum, that if you're if you're thinking about how does Servier feel right now, having thrown his lot in with Pétain, and he is, you know, and believing that the problem in life is these anti-nationals who don't believe in the collaboration, right? And how does the Chassagnes feel? And how does the, the Hortenses feel? Uh, the question of how the Jason Millers felt in that period uh, when it all starts to fall apart and it's not working and they're lying to themselves and they're, you know, maybe the Serviers are on January 6th saying, uh, uh, okay, you know, he's got to be impeached, but then they walk it back. I do think there's a psychological parallel in the way in the way people who made enormous compromises and or really abused uh, or, or, or humiliated themselves, uh, in the psychology of those people, there's an analogy that I think has, that still speaks to me a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I like sort of wish that that were true um, because I guess my, my actual fear about this moment in time is that, you know, the, and, and granted, it's not, it's not the same, right? So like, these are, this is Marchetti. Marchetti has been murdering people, hunting people down. And so when the political dynamic shifts, like he's, but like, you think about people who separated kids from their parents and implemented those policies. And you think about people who, um, just decided to politicize masks and the pandemic and, uh, 600,000 people died from this pandemic that like one side was saying just wasn't a big deal. Um, and so like they did horrible things, but the thing is like, they don't think that they did. Like the people in this show know that if the political environment changes, they're in real trouble. The people I think, that we're dealing with. I think with, Rudy Giuliani, like Shasanya, knows that knew in this period that if they lose things are going to go really badly for him. Well, that's an, he's an interesting one. Cause I think like Jason Miller thought, I don't know, I'm going to find this Chinese billionaire to fund my asinine social media platform. That's going to be taken over by furries. And like, I'm going to be fine. But I think, you know, Tom Barrack probably had a pretty good understanding that he was getting indicted if, uh, it, you know, and if Trump lost, he couldn't go to him for a pardon. You know, I think there's some look, and these people were not going to get strung up by the like the you know the French resistance killed some people at the end of the war, um, and so I don't I don't again I don't want to overstate the analogy, but you know I do think there was a kind of desperation at the toward the end of the Trump administration among people who knew they had compromised themselves very very badly. Yeah, well, I'm still waiting for that justice to come. Like, I, nothing has happened to Rudy Giuliani that's made me feel better yet, but I'm still hoping that it does. Hold that thought. Huh. All right. Ben, uh, thanks so much, and... Edith, take us home. Nous, nous aimions bien tendrement, comme t'aimes tous les...